Всех вас приветствую, дорогие братья и сестры. So let, let's continue our study in the letter of Philippians as we've been going through verse by verse, looking at what Paul has to say to this church in the city of Philippi. And we've got up to the second chapter. We will be looking at only two verses today, verses 12 and 13. But these two verses are really powerful and full of the truths that you know we could spend many, many hours just looking at what God has to say in these few verses, but we only have a short amount of time, and we'll look at these two verses together. But before we start reading these verses, I wanted to remind us of the context of which these verses are written. Remember the last time we talked about the humility of Jesus Christ, how he came down and became a servant, the lowest, he died on the cross, and he was uh, buried, and he rose, and God highly exalted him, and that, that the name of Jesus, every tongue should bow, and every knee confess that he is the Lord, King of kings, and Lord of lords. And in, in this great context, the next verses, he talks, talks about, Apostle Paul says what we have to do now with this great truth that Jesus Christ is exalted and seated in heaven. And now he has a word of encouragement for us so that we can put this uh, power into practice in our own lives. So let's read these two verses together. Philippians 2, 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is, writ for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasures. pleasure. Итак, возлюбленные мои, как вы всегда были послушны не только в присутствии моем, но гораздо более ныне в, э, в отсутствии моего. Со страхом и трепетом совершайте свое спасение, потому что Бог производит вас и хотение, и действие по своему благоволению. These two verses are full of truths of the Lord, and we see how Apostle Paul goes from this uh, theology how, who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us to now us living out the practical life of obedience. So he goes on here and talks about, he sets the standard so high that we could think we, we could never attain such a high standard because Jesus, nobody, uh, no man can ever attain that kind of standard. But Apostle Paul, in a way he's saying that's what should be our goal, that because God is working in us, to get to the same standard that Jesus Christ was. That's what our goal should ultimately be. And in this section, we see that Apostle Paul mentions obedience, and he says that there are two kinds of obedience, one that is done to please in, in the sight of man, and one is done in the sight of God. And that will be our, our first point that we will look at together. So the title of my message is Work Out What God Has Worked In You work out what God has worked in you, because we will see in verse 12, it says, work out your own salvation, but in verse 13, it says, God works in you. So we will see how this is interconnected, that we cannot work something out unless God has first worked in us and made a work of salvation in our hearts, and that is exactly what we just heard a few minutes ago, the helmet of salvation. God has to do a work in us to save us, and then we can uh, act in obedience to serve him. So I have three main points in my sermon today, the first of which is work out a proper kind of obedience. Work out a proper ki kind of obedience. So verse 12, the first part. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not, not as much in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So here we see that there is two kinds of obedience and the first obedience is only done in the presence of men or the presence of other people. And this is a co common type of obedience. And I'm sure that maybe in school, maybe the children um, have seen the situation where the teacher leaves for a few moments and the kids are all by themselves and they start acting up. They start throwing papers. They start doing wild stuff in the classroom. And as soon as they hear the teacher knock, coming close to the door, everybody stops and they start uh, beating. And the teacher walks in and it looks like nobody was doing anything wrong. And the same thing happens in the workplace. I'm sure it happens when uh, the boss is not around, no supervisor, 
you kind of maybe you get on your phone, you check Instagram, check whatever you want, and then as soon as you see the boss walk in, it's a total different atmosphere. Everybody puts, puts everything away. And that's the kind of obedience which Paul says should not be. Even though, yeah, we should obey in the presence of uh, our boss or teachers, but he's saying that our obedience should be a, a much step higher. Obedience that is, in, even if there's nobody around, we should still obey. So Apostle Paul actually calls this kind of obedience uh, eye service. Uh, in another uh, epistle of his, Colossians 3.22, he calls this eye service, which is serving uh, only in the presence of somebody when they are seeing, looking at you. So let's read this verse together. It says, th- Colossians 3.22, uh, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, Fearing God. As there it says, как служа не только в глазах, как человека угодники. So here we see eye service, that they were doing this just to be seen. And Apostle Paul says the Philippians were not that kind. They were a, a step above, just like in the Old Testament, we know that uh, the law commanded us to do one thing, but when Jesus came, he even rose the standard higher. He said, don't just not uh, commit adultery. Don't even think it in your mind. And this is the same kind of obedience. Don't just act good in front of your bonds, uh, in front of your masters, but even when there's nobody around, can uh, do the right thing because that is what God wants us to do. And the second type of obedience is done in the presence of, uh, in the absence of others. Or we can say in the presence of God because we know that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere and he knows everything. And if we, if we take that, mind, um, that thought in our mind and understand that even when there is nobody around and we see that God is everywhere, this should change us to the core and say, wow, Lord, I have to be obedient. I have to not just do what some people do, just eye service, but just do uh, wholehearted fearing God, as it says in this verse we just read. But in sincerity... Fearing God, sincerity of heart. So this is the proper type of obedience, and this is what Apostle Paul encourages the Philippians to do. And it is done to please God alone and to to have a pure conscience. That's what Apostle Paul calls the Philippians to and says he commends them. Obviously, in that time, there was no kind of communication like we have now, but either through Timothy or through Epaphroditus or a letter, somehow the, the news came back to Apostle Paul. He's saying, you're, uh, the church you planted, they, they're still obedient, even though you haven't been there and you are enslaved, but the, the church that you planted is being faithful in obedience. And that would, would have been the best news to Apostle Paul, hearing that while well, he is in, in a dungeon, being tortured for the sake of Christ, but knowing that what he planted in that church, it is bringing forth fruit. And this kind of obedience is demonstrated in a verse uh, that I would like to read together. It's Romans 6, 16 also. We see uh, another example of being obedient even when when nobody's around or being obedient in the presence of God. So Romans 6, 16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. So Apostle Paul says you, the obedience you have, it will lead you to righteousness. It will give you the right li- uh, type of life, not just obeying, uh, like it says before, obey whether uh, you are the one slave whom you obey, whether leading to sin, leading to death. So if we obey just in the presence of man, it will lead to death. But when we obey in the presence of the Lord, it will lead to a righteous life. And that's the Apostle Paul is commending the Philippian church for that. And uh, another thing I would like to point out here is that God has given us all things uh, necessary to, to live a life of obedience. There is no excuse a, a Christian can ever make to say, well, God, you gave this... Uh, preacher so much more talents he he can preach about you or we cannot say oh god you gave this person much more patience or compassion than me i i can't do that we no christian can use this excuse because god has given us everything we need to live a godly life and even here in this 
two verses we read here, it says to work out your salvation. But then in the next verse, it says that God works in you both to do and to will to his, uh, do his good pleasure. Another verse that confirms that God has given us no excuse to, to live a sinful life or to not do what, uh, what God wants us to do, not, um, to not obey God, is 2 Peter 1.3. This verse, I think it's very familiar to us. It's the verse that says, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So here he says his divine power has been given uh, uh, as to all of us. And w through this divine power we can uh, to live the godly life. And we can live a life of obedience. And that is what Apostle Paul calls us to here. So the first point we looked at is work out a proper kind of obedience. And just like uh, working out physically is a very difficult task, I'm sure some of you have the practice of maybe going to a gym and lifting weights or doing something and even exercising, running, any kind of exercise. It takes an enormous amount of uh, willpower to overcome that point of being at rest. Like there's somebody that says a body at rest stands, stays at rest, a body in motion stays in motion. So once you get over that and become and make it a routine, a habit, it's a lot easier. But if you do not force yourself it's really hard because there's so much people that start a, a gym membership and then just absolutely um, a few months later they, they never go, they never fulfill because it is hard work. And that is what Apostle Paul is saying. It's not easy. Work out your own salvation. So the first point was work out a proper kind of obedience. The second point is work out a proper fear of the Lord. And that is what we will see in the second part of verse 12. So it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. So what does it mean to work out your own salvation? Work out. So the word, like I said, the word in Russian is savirshaiti. To, and I actually think it's a better translation in Russian to bring to completion. Savirshit, make something more perfect or make it to complete it. Because... Apostle Paul is in no way saying we have to work to be saved because th this goes against uh, all the teachings of the Bible that we cannot do something to merit salvation. It is a gift of God. He's not saying to, you have to work and work and work and if you don't, you will not inherit salvation. He's saying that we have uh, the obedience um, when we work out our salvation, what God has done in us, we have the ability to work it out and show it and demonstrate it in, in godly living. So we see that this, is, this verse is not saying that we are saved by our works, but another verse I would like to read uh, that will help us understand what this word, the way this word is translated in Romans 7:18. So this word work out is translated in a, a slightly different way in Romans 7.18. It says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but to perform, to perform that which is good I find not. So the word to perform is actually the same word to work out. So we see how Apostle Paul admits that in me, in my, old, my body, my flesh, there dwells nothing good. And I can't, even though I want to, I have a desire to live a godly life. But without the, the um, spirit, without God working in me, my, by, by myself in my flesh, I have no, desire, no ability to perform to completion. To, to not, I cannot do this on my own. So an example I thought I would bring uh, maybe to demonstrate this in a little bit more of a practical way that... Maybe we could understand a little better. So let's imagine uh, uh, somebody has a rich parents. Maybe they, they own a, a big plot of land. Maybe it's a, a hill, a mountain or something that they decide to uh, just give it over to their son because they're getting old and they cannot do anything with them, with that land. But before um, 
the parents could do anything with this land. Somebody that was working and found out that there is gold in a, uh, underground and th th there's a way to dig it out, maybe make a mine and dig the gold out. So the, the parents give this inheritance to the, their son and say, you have a, you're potentially, you could be a multimillionaire if you tap into that gold, uh, it's in there. So technically they have, the son has all this potential, but until he taps into it, he, he might have to hire uh, many, many workers and over many years, he will have to give up of his own money, it might cost half a million or however much it costs to ex extract that gold from that mine. And unless he does that, it will just be uh, potential money. He cannot say to his friends, you know, I'm a millionaire because technically he's not until he taps into it. So this person has two options. He could just use that land, maybe build a house on it and live a normal life. Or he could take some risk and say, okay, I will sacrifice my, the money that I have. I will do everything and extract that money to become rich. So in a, in a way, many Christians live the Christian life in a way where we have the potential to be great, to do uh, awesome things for the Lord. But we choose to not uh, tap into it. In a, in a, the, we choose not to work out what God has uh, already given us. He given, he's given us the ability. So this person could just live an average life or he could work out. So in, God has given us the ability to, to be Christians that, you know, we could change the whole world. But sometimes we choose to be just the average, average Christians that do not, do, do not take risks. Because we know that God has given all of us the ability if we only want to become do great things for the Lord, to serve him in a way that honors him. Just like the Philippian church, they were obedient. Even when Paul was long gone, they were still obedient to him. They, they were working out the things that Paul has given them, the instructions they were working out. They were working out their own salvation. So what does the word mean to work it out in fear and trembling? And we know that there, in the Christian life, there's a proper... Uh, place for the, the fear of God. We know that to fear the Lord is not a bad thing. It's not like we're, when you say, when you fear somebody, maybe you fear a stranger, you're fearing them because you're afraid of what they might do to you. But when we tremble before the Lord, it, is, it always leads to something good. There's um, many, many instances of the Bible saying what the fear of the Lord does for us. A few of them is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We know that from the Proverbs. If we want to have knowledge, that's where it will always begin. The fear of the Lord also causes us to hate evil and to uh, hide away, do, to not do bad things to other people when we have the fear of the Lord because it will always cause us to think about the uh, repercussions, to think about the consequences. Also, the fear of the Lord, uh, it says, prolongs life. In uh, Pro Proverbs 10, 27, it says that we who... Uh, we will have a good and prosperous life if we fear the Lord. So the proper place for the fear of the Lord is when we understand <clears throat> who we stand before. So if we stand before the Lord and we understand that if we fear him, it will actually lead us to love him more. Because Apostle John actually wrote about this. He says that uh, love dispels fear. So this kind of fear, trembling, will actually lead us to love God more. And let's, let's look at what John says. 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17 actually says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, of his, because, of his, um, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So I understand that John is talking about the fear of man. When you have, when you have the fear of God, you no longer have the fear of man, and that leads us to love God more because of what he has done for us. And I think a lot of people don't have the love of God because they have not first come to the point of, having uh, trembling and fearing before God, understanding that if it wasn't God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, like we read in the previous verses, to, um, 
being found in the fashion of man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to death on the cross. If he had not done that for us, then we would have been bound to hell. And we have to tremble before that because if it wasn't for what God has done through Jesus Christ, we would have all been doomed to hell. But Jesus gave us a way out, and the only way is in working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So what role does man have what role does man have in our salvation does it, it seems like does god just do everything or does man have a participation and obviously here it, it's a two-sided coin it says in one sense work out your own salvation but the next verse says for it is god which worketh in you both to will and to do so it's two-sided we, we'll see how that is all interconnected i would like to read uh second peter 110, this verse actually tells us a little bit, shows us a little bit better how this is all connected. So 2 Peter 1.10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more di- diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Make your election sure. And th- this is actually connected to the passage we read earlier where it talks about his divine power has given us everything we need to live a godly life and then he says make your election sure because by by living a godly life there's no nobody can ever cause us to stumble even if we sin we have the mediator which is jesus christ and he forgives us when we uh, repent before him so we see that man is not totally helpless in his salvation god has done everything for us and we have to accept that call and at, at the same time we have to put our energy work out what God has already worked in us. So the second point we looked at is work out a proper fear of the Lord. And the last thing I would like to point out is, thirdly, work out a proper understanding of God's will. Work out a proper understanding of God's will. So that's the last verse, 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So this is talk, talking about the will of God, what God wants from us, and it is always good, as it says in, in Russian, потому что Бог производит вас и хотение, и действие по своему благоволению, the good will of God towards us. So we know that God's first will in, uh, for man, any man, is always in the salvation of his soul, that's what God wants, and everything that happens, um, unless that happens, God will always be calling us, calling people to salvation. And once a man is saved, then we see how the process of sanctification comes, and God wants to make us more and more like him. So Peter writes, also Second Peter 3, 9, he tells us that God is, does not want anybody to perish. He says, the Lord is not s- slack concerning his promises, as some count his slackness, but his long suffering towards us, not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We see this is the will of God towards us. We see that without God's involvement, we would never have come to salvation. So we also have to be very thankful for the Lord that he has first seen us. He's seen us in our need, um, our lowly state. He saw when we were sinners and he chose to to, to send his son for us and he revealed himself to us and then he wants us to participate and to work out, like it says here, work out our own salvation. So notice that Paul writes, for it is God who works in you. So we are not alone. We have to remember that any good thing that happens in our life, it's always God working in us. So let's never think that God just saves us and then he leaves us alone to do whatever we, uh, we want. No, God uh, always uh, participates in our lives. He wants us to become more and more like him. He wants us to become more holy and to find out his will, to find the will of God in our lives. So in a way, so in what way does God work in us? So we see how it's to will and to do, two parts. So to will, God will, God helps us in our desires and motivations to do his will. So the first part, we see um, how God 
changes our will sometimes. So remember last week we had a sermon in the morning where if you delight yourself in the Lord and do not trust in your own understanding, but he will give you the desires of your heart. So somebody could say, well, I delight in the Lord and he will give me everything I want. No, God will change your desires, your motives, your to to, to want what God wants in the first place. That's what it means that God will change our will to fulfill what God wants in, in this world. And the time that he gave us to live, which is a very short time, as we read um, the Bible reading in the, uh, the first, the letter of uh, uh, the Psalm of Moses, we see how God gave such a short time to do something good. And we see that, that there that we have a short time to work and to, to do what God called us to do. And then it says to do. The second part of this verse says, he works us, for it is God which work in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So the word to do is actually a very interesting word. And if you look at it in the Greek, it's a, a very familiar word. I think if, you, if I say it, it it's pronounced energen, or it's a word that we get energy from. So God gives us the energy to live a godly life. So we, have to, we see here that God, he w changes our will, but he also gives us the energy and the desire and the power to live according to the will of God. So that the, God gives us energy. And this goes back to, the, to the, the text we read in Peter where it says, His divine power has given us everything to live a godly life. This divine power, this energy that God gives us to work out our own salvation and to, to be faithful till the end. That's what Apostle Paul is, is looking at here. And he's saying the Philippian church was faithful even though he was absent, but they were faithful. And that brought great joy to Apostle Paul knowing that he, the, what he planted was bringing forth great fruit. So the last... Uh, verse I would like to read before we pray together is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. This is uh, a verse where it says that God wants us to be partners with him. God gave us everything, but he wants us to work with him to fulfill great things. If, if we do not do something for the Lord, he will find somebody else. But he always wants us to, to do uh, great things for him. Just like you know, in our Sunday school, we are studying about Esther and we see that Mordecai told her, if you do not do this, if you do not save your nation, do not stand for your nation, that God will save, um, save the, the nation of Israel through another means, but you will die. But he says, for such a time you were called, such a time as this you were called to be a, a queen in Persia. So this, uh, let's, let's read Hebrews 13, 20. This says that we are going to be partners with the Lord to serve him because God wants to do a work in us. So, Hebrews 13, uh, 20. Now, may the God of peace who brought, us, brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of our sheep through the blood of everything, uh, everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is, what is well-pleasing in, in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So God can only do in us what we allow him to do. So God wants to do a work in us. Only if we are willing, then he will work in us. So let's be willing to allow the Lord to work in us. And let's not be like that man that got that huge mind and was, has all that potential to be rich, but he would just uh, ignore it and say, oh, I'm happy just having this in my possession Let's tap into that. Let's work out. So just like we looked at, work out a proper kind of obedience. Work out a proper fear of the Lord. And the last thing, work out a proper understanding of God's will. And this will all give us the, like we read here, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And the Apostle Paul says, work out your own. We have to always remember that we cannot uh, work at somebody else's salvation. We, cannot, we can pray and hope that God works in our children, in our parents, in our relatives, in our neighbors. But here he calls, work out your own salvation. Work on your own desires. Make it sure it pleases the Lord and be obedient to him, whether you are in presence of uh, 
people or just absolutely alone and in the presence of God, do what is pleasing to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together.